time together. We thank you for our family, Father. We thank you for this Shabbat, Father, a gift that you've given us that we can just kind of come in at the end of a week, Father, hopefully a week of testimonies of your love, your goodness, your kindness, Father, what you've done for us this week. And as we sit down at your feet, Father, I pray that you would lead us and help us as we prepare, Father, for the seventh month. And we pray that it would be something meaningful and for your glory. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So, mention this, that we talk about the month of Elul. Okay. Nowhere in your Bible are you going to hear this term. Right? Elul, your Bible, you're going to call it's the sixth month. Now, there's a lot of emphasis that gets placed on this in rabbinic Judaism. Okay? And we've got to go, why? Why is the sixth month an important time for us? Oh, he's in the field. Sorry, Nadine. Sorry. The preparations and the focus the Right. Okay. So we're preparing for the seventh month. What's the seventh month? Why is that important? Right. So we get another cycle of feasts. Right. Remember, we had a really nice party here at one point. We went from. Pesach, unleavened bread, and first fruits. This all happened in which month? First month. First month. Okay, 14th day, 15th day for seven days, and then the first day after Sabbath during the week of unleavened bread. You're with me, right? This led us to a counting season from the time of first fruits. We are to count the Omer. And that is seven Sabbaths or seven sevens. And on the 50th day, Shavuot or the festival of weeks. You guys know weeks? As in one week, lots of weeks. All right? Then we're going into our next cycle, publicly called the Yom Teruah, rabbinically called Rosh Hashanah. Okay, Rosh Hashanah is the head of the year. Publicly, you will find that statement once or twice. Never talking about the first day of the seventh month. Always talking about Passover. Okay, so they've adapted something, but before we go, Oi, va, voy, can't trust anything, Brother Judah says, me kind of lead you into their understanding. This is the first day of the seventh month. On the tenth day, you have. Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement. Yom Teruah means the day of making noise. And then on the 15th day, starting for a cycle of eight days, I'm including Shemini Seret, or the eighth day convocation in that, we have Sukkot or Tabernacles. Right. So we went from, we need to get ready, clean out your house, make sure that you are prepared for Pesach. Remember this being a Christ-centered reality. As I prepare to remember, when he said, every time you do this, think of me, he didn't institute Nachmal or communion. He was talking about Passover. Right? We've taken communion into our congregations and we go, well, this is a good time to remember the wine and the bread. Remember when he was doing that, it was very particular because when he was dealing with the wine, particularly the third cup, what was he really saying? Return. Yeah, will you marry me? Right? So every time you drink this, 
remember that betrothal cup sets up the cycle or the redemptive plan of what God is doing. From the time of crucifixion, burial, resurrection, pouring out the Holy Spirit, to now a time of anticipation. And that time of anticipation leads us down into the next cycle, which we're going to get into in more detail. I'll peel one of these, each one, again, open it up so that you guys can get full understanding. Okay? For some of you, it'd be recap. Others, I like to do the teaching before so we don't have to focus too much on the teaching on the day. So you can celebrate. When we get to this place or the sixth month, Elul, it seems that there is a time of preparation here that happens. Just like over here, before we get into Passover, it is a time to prepare. It's a time of cleaning. It's a time of getting ready. Anytime you go before the king, you should be in a state of preparation. Okay? Now you think of Esther and those, those times where I'm going to go, all right, I'm going to go stand in his presence. These are big appointments. Mo'edim. Remember what Mo'ed means? Or Mo'edim? Yeah. Always translated generally as feast in the English, but it's not really because you don't feast on Yom Kippur, do you? No. Right. It's literally an appointed time. Mo'edim. So no, it's, an, it's an appointment. Okay? Yes. Sometimes we like to eat lots. If you're a part of our congregation, you like to eat and eat and eat. And then we get to the place of going, okay, now we're going to celebrate. We're going to celebrate the fact of what God's done. We're going to celebrate the fact of what he's going to do. But this cycle of feast is something that as we look back, we see fulfillment in Yeshua's ministry. As in, this is what the Old Testament said it was going to be. These are the finer details of that promise, and now you fully understand it. And then we get to the seventh month cycle where we're going to go, this is what the Old Testament vaguely told you about. And oh, by the way, there's some things that I haven't yet completely overlapped yet to give you the full understanding. We're waiting for the fullness of that for the most part. You with me? Okay. So before I get stuck into Elul, I just want to clarify this reality. The reason the Jews get to the place of Rosh Hashanah is because we seem to have different cycles going on through our calendar. What do I mean by that? Agricultural. Agricultural cycles. So around this time at Passover, we have? Barley. Around this time, we have? Wheat. And around this time? The rest. Some harvest will go on through December. But your main harvest, grape cycles and so on, this will be the end of the gathering. So basically, you should have enough food in your silos to see you through until the next time. Okay. So then we go, okay, that's fantastic. So there is a cycle within a cycle. <clears throat> so when I talk about Shavuot, I should immediately go, we're talking about bread. The good bread. The wheat harvest. If we're talking about Passover, we're talking about barley. We're talking about Sukkot, we're talking about grapes. Right? So, me by mentioning the type of harvest that's in should immediately tell you the spiritual connotation behind it. Okay, so that's a cycle within a cycle. Now, if you study Torah, as some of you have, you get to the place of, all right, well, there's this thing called the sabbatical year or the Shemitah, or, and also a jubilee year or the Yovel. When do we set the people free from the sabbatical year and the year of Jubilee? When? Jubilee. Yeah, when do we do it? The Jubilee is the 50th year. The Bible is very clear. Which day? On the 10th day of the 7th month, you will blow a shofar and you will tell them they're free. Now you're going to stop and you're going to ask yourself, who starts the sabbatical year in Yom Kippur when it's on the 10th day of the seventh month? God does. Is it confusing? Absolutely. 
See, because we think in Greek, we think, okay, the calendar, well, it's the first of January, and the end is that time, December, and that's our cycle. So if I'm going to say New Year in our mindset, we go back to the first of January. But God doesn't. He says, there's something linked to Yom Kippur, the sabbatical year, Shemitah, and the Jubilee that I want you to understand. It's about relationship. Okay? And that's an interesting study in itself that I'm not going to get into. Not right now. So what he does is, because it's a time of preparation, our dear brothers will go, okay, Rosh Hashanah, therefore, cannot be over there. It must start on the first. So if it culminates to a sabbatical year, and it culminates to a year of Jubilee, therefore, our counting should also be there. That's where they got to that line of thinking was. What I'm telling you, it's traditional, it's not biblical. All right? So when I look at that and I go, it's Rosh Hashanah, and I go, well, not really. It's called Yom Tiruah. That's what God called it. But I understand where you're going. Okay? Yeah. Is that also where the 10 days of all comes from? That they start from Yom Tiruah, counting the 10 days of all to Yom Kippur. Because I've looked for that in the Word, I've never seen it in the Word. Doesn't exist. Okay? What Zander is talking about is that there's something here called the 10 days of awe. And they will talk about a time of 40 days. For 40 days starts from the 30 days of Elul, roughly. Of Elul plus the 10 days of awe will give you 40 days to get your act together before your appointment at Yom Kippur. So we have these traditional elements in the month of Elul built into the time of preparation. You will hear people say, it's Elul, the king is in the field. Mm -hmm. You go, oh, that's so beautiful. Where did they get that from? From my <laughs> A rabbi, actually. <laughs> we repeat it, but again, we, we, we probably don't go into it as much as we, as, as we should. It was a rabbi who asked, let me, I wrote this down so that I don't get it wrong. It says, when asked of the, to describe the tightening of the bond between God and the Jewish people in the time of Elul, he set forth a parable. The king is in the field. Now the Hasidic interpretation of that means, he says, it is a month of mercy, repentance, and closeness. Why? The king is in the field. So when the king comes back into the city after being victorious. The city, because they love their king, run out into the field to greet him. So what does it mean to be the king is in the field? He's coming back into the city. Let's run out to him and let's celebrate with him. It is. And this is why even in the midst of Biblical tradition, we see elements where Yeshua picked up upon and he goes, oh, you understand this, you'll see this again. The same as when we took with Passover and we took out the yachats, the bag with the three sections, and they take the middle one and they break it and they wrap it in a specific cloth and they go hide it for a time. And then the sent one or the hidden one, and you go find him, you get a great reward. And they do this year in and year out, and I scratch my head and I go, how can you not see him? So in the time of preparation, what Nadine is referring to is we believe, and I'll get into it in more detail, that Yom Teruah is a time where Yeshua said, when he says, no one knows the time or the hour of my coming. That was a Galilean marriage thing. It says, only daddy knows. Right? So when he says, in typical Galilean custom, he will wait, the father will wait until everyone is sleeping around midnight, and he picks a random night, and he's wakes this boy up and he goes, it's time to go get her. No one knows the time. He makes the decision and he says it's now. Gets everyone up. Whole village. And then we start making the preparation. And as we go through, as we get closer, what do we do? You announce the coming of the groom with the shofar. So that she can get ready, so she can come stand outside, hoping, remember you don't have email or telegram or Hey, my love, I'll be there in 15 minutes. Please get ready. This is the case of, I hope this is the one coming for me. Because there might be two or three ladies in the village that are betrothed. And that bride is in a time of anticipation. 
So if you know the season of the coming, which I'll get into again, it's actually mentioned in Thessalonians. You might not know the day or the hour, but you will know the season. And he says, well, you need to get ready. And if the king is in the field, if Yeshua is on his way into the city, getting ready for you to be right here, he's giving you this time to prepare. You with me? So Elu becomes sort of a pre-Passover, I hope my house is clean. Elu kind of goes, I hope my dress is spotless. If you understand the process that the betrothal will happen here and everything else up until then is preparation, the time for preparation is now. So the Jews will go out and they will start to gather and then they will say a list of prayers called the shlichot. Shlichot, basically when I bump someone, I say shlicha, which means excuse me. But it's more than that. It's kind of like, um, forgive me. So when they cry out during this time of 40 days, they will go through a cycle of prayers and they will go, oh man, I hope I'm ready. See, for Rosh Hashanah, for them, again, they have a tradition, and again, it's rabbinic. Don't get too stuck in the rabbinic. That they will go, this is the time where God seals my fate. Is he writing me in the book of life? Guys, if you've accepted Yeshua, you should already be in the book. This is not a time of, oh, I hope I make the cut. This is a time of, oh, oh, oh. There might be 25, 25 days or 26 days or 27 days left on this earth. What am I going to do if that shofar goes and I see him this, this time? Are you ready? Is the heart condition right? Am I going to see him coming on the clouds and then I'm going to be like, I knew it. Or am I going to be like, I'm not packed. I haven't spoken to this one. Let me carry this whole unforgiveness thing with me. Help me while well, I'm still stuck in the world and I'm still building my kingdom. I don't, I'm not sure if I want to leave. It's a time of processing that I need to kind of check. And again, I know it's traditional, but it's kind of a gut check thing because again, when we get closer to Yom Kippur, and I have to deal with my sin. And this is a time of setting free, and it's a time of jubilee, and whatever the scenario is, that God's kind of linking these ideas together. Perhaps this is my time when he says, get ready, you're going home. Because jubilee is about inheritance, man. And my inheritance is with him. It's something extremely profound and something extremely beautiful about anticipation of that which is coming, which we're going to get into more. But if I don't get my heart right, you know what I find amazing about a lot of Hebraic root, Messianic, whatever you want to call this thing, or even in normal Christian understanding, I want to study Revelation so I know how much time I have left. I want to study Rapture so that I can make sure that I don't get left behind. What are they, the underlying statement? Is that how long do I have to live my life until I have to clean up and then prepare myself for the Lord? There is something so fundamentally disconnected with the heart condition in that. And I can smile because we've all done it at one time. And we're going to go, all right, well, it's actually not really about whether or not I'm anticipating his coming. It's actually about how much can I get away with before I have to give an account. For us as believers, for us as disciples that are pursuing Christ, that he, like, cringe at the idea of going home. Not even in the least. It's, the, it's where he, it's the relationship, the understanding, the, yeah, we're echad. There's no mistaking this beautiful truth. And he said, listen, I'm going to come and fetch you. You should be waiting with bated breath. What bride is hesitating the day of her marriage if she is full in, whole heart, with complete faith and trust in the person that she's walking down to. Should we? So as we get into Elul, 
we're going to have to go, okay, this is a time where we check our heart condition. Now, another interesting little side note. A lot of people will say, when we look at these four letters, it can also form an acronym. Or Elul stands for Ani Le Dodi Ve Dodi Ni. I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. So when I look at it and I go, well, this is a time again. If I am my beloved and my beloved is mine, if we understand that Yeshua is going to come around the time of Yom Tiruma as a future implication, is this what I'm preparing my heart for? Is that what I'm saying? Here I am, Lord, my heart is yours. So there's going to be a process. Okay? The traditional element that we kind of go through and we, um, and we go into it a bit with Yom Kippur is we send out this thing called an El Chet prayer. Okay? And the El Chet is just a simple tool to help you start asking tough questions about your walk. How have I sinned? You know, and they'll go into ridiculous detail. And the first time I read it, you know, forgive me, Father, for the rolling of the eyes was one of them, I think. And the first time I read it, I went, oh, please. <laughs> and then you started to read this explanation. What am I really doing when someone talks to me and I roll, them, roll my eyes? Showing disrespect. Go back to the mitzvah. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Would you love yourself by rolling your eyes? Would you want that for you if you were talking to someone and they did that to you? No, not at all. And I'm like, oh, so they've got a point. What is my heart going to do? <laughs> and, and that's when we get to that place and we start to understand that that little thing is exactly showing intent and heart condition of something that shouldn't be there. Mm. It's that so we get to, but this is part of the problem. Remember, we can only work on ourselves, and I'm inviting you guys on this journey to sit down and you focus on yourself, and you're going to go, I, I can't control what the world does. They're going to act like the world. But Yeshua is going to look at you, and he's going to go, I don't care if they act like the world, that's the world, but did you act like me? You know, do we, do we get sharp? Do we get closed off? Do we get bratty? Do we get... And then we kind of get to this place where we're kind of not reflecting Christ anymore because we want our own way. We want what we want, how we want it, when we want it. And if we don't get it, then everybody else is unhappy. Yeshua was being crucified. He was still teaching. He was still interceding. And we throw our toys out the cart when we don't get the attention we want, or we don't get the response we want, or we don't get whatever we want. And then we start to go, well, okay, guys, where's the heart? And this is tough, because in that moment, you are fully justified in your response. Until you compare yourself to Christ, and you realize you are completely falling short of what you set out to do. See, there's going to be that struggle within yourself. The whole time. But hopefully, as you continue more and more to pursue Christ, the Ruach is going to continue to mold you into that image. So my natural response might be to shout at you, but what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to hug you. My natural response were to tell you 15 things that you're doing wrong because it doesn't measure up to my expectation. My, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit down, I'm going to take a breath, and I'm going to go... My perception versus God's perception of that person. You understand the difference? I shared with you the one story we did. We did with a. Um, it was a course that we were invited on called "The World Needs a Father," and there's a. It kind of takes you through the processes of what it's like when fathers do not take up their position or what's the damage when they leave and so on and so forth. And it's, it's a very interesting sort of thing to understand kids and the influence you have. And there's this, uh, this, this worm, his name was Wumkasi, and uh, he, was, he was sharing his frustration. 
Yeah, his perception with his wife. It says when he married her, well, she, she walks into a house and she's busy in the kitchen. And she, if she walks past a cupboard, she opens it and she never closes it. And it drove him moggy. <laughs> and he like walked behind it, eventually walking behind, slamming doors. He goes, what's wrong with you? Why can't you just close it? And she's like, I'm not hardwired that way. It doesn't bug me. And then she carries on. <laughs> And he is really getting to the point of frustration and is all the rest of it. And he goes out and he's like seriously trying to figure out his wife. And then he starts to pray. And he, God asked him, is that your expectation of her? Or is it a, is it a biblical expectation? He goes, well, what do, you, what do you mean? He says, is she a bad person? Can you love her less because she doesn't clo close cupboard doors? Find that anywhere in the world. <laughs> and he was like, Oh, well, this is my expectation. As you know, when we pray, your will be done. The expectation of my spouse should be a biblical one. I want you to be a godly woman. And that needs to be, that has nothing to do with closing doors. So I'm getting frustrated because it doesn't fit my expectation. So God told him, let it go. And he was like, you know what, you're right. Actually, I'm putting all this pressure on her to do something. That she, as a, as a believer, has got nothing to do with it, but everything to do with me. And we kind of go through life in those kind of processes where sometimes the pastor's expectation of you is to act and dress and certain, be a certain thing. And he will bang and mold and shout and scream and cry and all the rest of it to try and get you to become something that you're not. Maybe it's something we do to our kids. Yeah, sat there counseling a lady once and having a discussion, and we're in marriage counseling, and uh, she kept on she kept on referring back to, you know, let's say her maiden name was Krobla, and she's sitting there next to her husband. You know, she's been married there for a while, and she looks at me and she goes, "You act this certain way," and she goes, "It's a Krobla thing." And I'm like, "How long have you been married?" I was like, no, 12 years. I'm like, when does it stop becoming a problem thing? It's like, you took on his surname. Well, maybe we should really start to focus on the fact of when is it a Christ thing? You get where I'm going? It goes through this process where we kind of justify our responses and we don't measure ourselves up against what's here. So what I want to, what I want to do today? Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's lots of there's lots of real life personality that would have come in there. We probably would have looked at them as they came in here and gone. That's definitely not biblical. Actually, it's very biblical. Uh, <laughs> All right, I'm going to remind you of something that your rabbi has said. Remember, part of this is preparation to build up to make sure that we're spotless and to make sure that at Yom Kippur, that we're good, right? That I can deal with my relationship with God. Now, before I can deal with my relationship with God, listen to what your rabbi taught, Matthew 5, 24. He says, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. What was he talking about? If you know your brother has something against you. If you know your brother has something against you. Now let's put that into practice. You might have walked for three days with your offering. You stand in the queues for hours. You've mikvahed. Make sure that you cleanse. You come up ready to hand it over. And then the rabbi says, mm -mm. Remember that grumbling oak that you left in the camp? Oh Lord, I'm focusing on my, on my walk with you. Here I am to worship you. He says, no, no, you go fix up there first, and then you come back, and then, you, then, you, then, then we talk. You want me to leave my offering here? You want me to walk for another three days? You want me to go sit and have a conversation with a guy I probably don't like? Sort it out, and then you want me to walk another three days back before you will accept my offering? 
Uh, I just would like to ask a question. Um, what is you? Who is your brother? Is it someone doing the will, or you know? I mean, there's so many random people in the world. Who is your brother? And, 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 and how do you prevent casting pills for swine type of thing? There's a, okay. Uh, let me let me let me let me let me pre. Let me deal with that and then I'll preempt the next question or the next step because I think this is where we're going, right? Because if my brother has something against me, then I'll want to fix up. So <laughs> as Yeshua taught, those who do, do the will of my Father in heaven, right? So let's start small. Let's start with your home. If your husband or your wife has something against you, don't come to me, go sort it out and then you can come to me. Maybe your kids. Let's expand the net a little bit because we can't say family because not all family are believers, right? Maybe it's your congregation. Maybe you sit your week in and week out, but you don't actually want to talk to this person or that person because maybe you should deal with that. All right? And there's a good indicator. There's a nice little test I like to do. When I think of the person's name, do I get a little knot in my stomach? Steve, oh. <laughs> and you feel that little tweak, right? Yeah, underneath your solar plexus for me. And you might hold your breath just a little bit because you know that there's something there that's just not sorted out. It says, maybe before Christ comes to fetch me, maybe I should just have that conversation to make sure that we're okay. Okay? But to take it a step further, you might not be able to fix up with your enemies, but sometimes <coughs> Scripture teaches you to love your enemies, to bless your enemies. I've had to fix relationships with people that were unbelievers. I remember sitting there driving in my car on the way to work, and then there was something that happened 10 years before, and God said, I'm like, Elul, Father, tell me, thinking, you know, I did a pretty good job of keeping short accounts with people. And then he said, that person. I'm like, that was 10 years ago. I can't, I don't, know, I don't even know how to get hold of this guy. That person doesn't like me. <laughs> I said, fix up. And I went, okay, Lord. I had to track the person down. I had to explain that I went from, because when I did the thing that wasn't so great, I was an unbeliever. I said, look, that scenario of who I was and whatever, I take full ownership of what I did. I wasn't a very nice person at that time, and I misused your trust, and it's unacceptable. And he was just like, listen. So I'm like, no, it wasn't right. He says, but, you know, God set me straight. I'm a believer now, and I'm working really, really hard by his grace, and he's, he's, he's changed me. Depends. Isn't there also that scripture that says we mustn't dwell on the things of the past? Right. But if there is, again, if we dwell or we focus on the back, depends on the, the perspective of which we're getting to, right? Which is something we're going to get into. Is that sometimes Satan uses my past as a tool against me. Yeah. Like, oh, you're never going to change. You're still committing the same old sin. And it becomes part of that identity theft, yeah. right? He's talking about that. If I have to, again, when I'm dealing with myself, I realize I've got to go, okay, you know, listen, if I've sinned and God's forgiven me, I'm not going to bring that up and think I'm anything less than what he says I am. But if I know that I scratched Gary's car and I still haven't said sorry, it's not dwelling on the past, that's me going, this isn't both, I scratched your car. You know, I felt really bad and that's why I've been hiding away the whole time from you. But, you know, I, I, there's a difference. I'm aiming for reconciliation, Right? And you're probably not going to get it with every single person, but sometimes it's me putting the ball up into that person's court. So part of the challenge you're going to face is, Gary, I scratched your car. And Gary's going to go, man, just go jump off a bridge. Leave me alone. Just pay for it. No, Gary's not so nice. <laughs> you know? He's going he's, he's to tell me, and I was like, you know, it's, it's, it's like, there's nothing you can say. There's nothing you can do. Just leave me alone. So what he does then is he has to deal with his unforgiveness. What happens if someone comes to you in the congregation and says, you know what, Raz, I'm, I'm sorry. And then you go, 
okay, now the ball's in my court and I have to then reciprocate. I'm either going to forgive as Yeshua commands us to or I'm going to hold on to that unforgiveness. So sometimes in our aiming of reconciliation here is going to highlight the fact that actually we both need that level of forgiveness because I can't keep on bringing up the past. You with me? It reminds me of that beautiful chapter of Corinthians where Paul gives an analogy of what love is and one of those things is love is not remembering past wrongs. Love is kindness. Yes, okay. 1 Corinthians 13. Not remembering um, yeah. past wrongs. We, 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 we shouldn't. But we get to the place of, okay, we're, we're okay, don't stress about that. But until I hear you say it, I might think you have an issue with me. And then I'm not going to be as open with you as what we should be. Sure. Forgiveness doesn't with your say, brother or, or even anybody. Forgiveness is important because it sets you free. But you don't always have the restoration. Right. Right. Necessarily. But no, no. But at least it gives you that release that you go, I have gone, I've taken the step and I've done what God, God has required of me as a believer. Right? And then it's up to him. Then, then you're either going to do it, Father, I, I tried to reconcile. I tried to, let's put it this way. If I'm, if I'm a believer and I leave a bad taste in your mouth because I'm having a bad day, that person's going to understand my God to say, that, you know, I believe that that's okay. But the reality is that if I create that shift in my mouth, when you're going to understand, listen, okay, he might have got it wrong, but he came to me and he said, listen, I'm, I messed up. Now all of a sudden there's maybe a bit of an accountability thing there that I'm going, listen, I, I, need, I need you to understand that God is trying to deal with my heart. I'm not going to get it perfect every time, but I need you to know that we're okay. Or I'm taking ownership of what I've done. S simple analogy. Okay, My kids coming here, they're busy playing around. I'm sitting over there, I'm talking, and then over there I see Rachel slap Jaden. And then she runs up to me and she goes, Daddy, Daddy, after I finish teaching, and then she gives me a big hug. What's Daddy's response? <laughs> You're cute. Don't come here and hug me. Sort that sort out with your brother. Right? Go and sort that out, and then we can come and we can talk. Okay, Dad. What you did there? Not right. So when we do that to each other, and then we run up, Daddy, 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 look at the pretty sheep I brought you. <laughs> it's like I just saw you slap your brother over there and then you come up to me and then you tell me you want to give me a sheep nice you're cute or you I mean we've done with marriage a little bit of marriage discussions before with biblical stuff you know you treat your spouse badly you treat your brother badly you treat this badly you come up here you, maybe you even treat the word with contempt because of where it's coming from and then we want to daddy 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 forgive me father for I have sinned where you take zero accountability. You justify your responses. Your heart becomes hard. You're always right. Mm -hmm. And then what? Daddy, daddy, forgive me. As you, you know I want to, but you are so missing the point. Right? And this, this is a difficult this is a difficult season because I want you to go and pray and I want you to ask Father to say, listen, Father, where I'm getting it wrong, I want you to highlight. Maybe it's a friendship that's broken down. You start with your inner circle, you work your way into your congregation, you walk around to brothers maybe that you have not done well with and then go from where God guides you to so that you can let go of the past. You with me? All right. Part of this process. Now, some of you might be going through this and we're going to go, okay, well, I just don't seem to be getting where I want to be in my walk with God. Okay? So, going through the Alchet and that over the years, we started to just think. You know, if sin is hampering me back, why or what is it in me that is stopping me from moving forward in this area of my life? I want to be a disciple. I want to follow him. I want to pursue him. I want to love. I want to, I want to go through this whole process. But there might be something that's holding me back. Okay? So we're going to look at a few things. 
right? We've already touched on the fact of unforgiveness. Now, unforgiveness is a two-folded issue. One, I do not forgive anybody else. Why? What do we want when I don't want to forgive people? No, not so much a pride thing. I want justice, generally. And, uh, hmm? revenge. sorry? Revenge. Or revenge, well, that might be justice, you know. Right. And as as grown ups admit that they did something wrong, then we can process. Then we can process, yeah. But what happens if they look at you and they go, No. So therefore you cannot forgive. Yeah. <laughs> and now you're stuck. Yeah. I'm holding on this giant ball of unforgiveness and then I read when your show says, Pray this way. Okay, Rabbi, I will pray this way. Our Father. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those, but I refuse to forgive them. And I, I, I pray over that, but I mean, it's just that my, my biggest problem and, and my sister's biggest problem is they just want him to sort of Admit to what they've done. Really? They're never going to admit to what they've done. Then, they're then you're still, if you are you still they're wanting them to admit that they're wrong, then you are still holding on to something. Yeah. And forgiveness is not there. Gonna, uh, or forgiveness is not there. Because you, you get to the point where we go, oh, yo, you just wait. God's going to sort you out, right? Isn't it amazing when you hurt other people and you go to Father, what do you cry out for? Mercy, forgiveness, Father, please be patient with me. Right? And when someone else hurts you, what do you cry out for? Smite them with lightning. <laughs> I suppose it's that, like that parable of the servant that was released of his debts, and yeah. yet he didn't want to forgive people that owed him money. Yep. So he got locked up. And he got stuck in torment. Yeah. Unforgiveness is going to breed torment. Listen to me. You get stuck into a place where we hurt each other, we break trust, we refuse to become vulnerable. Whatever the scenario is, we get to the point where we go, that's it, unless you admit you're wrong. <laughs> and yet, when God goes, mm -hmm, how many times have you done it with me? Yeshua said, forgive we need to ask for forgiveness as we have forgiven those. Our forgiveness hinges on how we forgive others. So when you go into Yom Kippur and you're saying, Father, please forgive us, even though I have the blood of Christ, even though I'm saying, Father, through Yeshua, please forgive us. And he goes, well, okay, did you, did you share that freely with others? No. Unforgiveness. If that's a thing for you, I want you to pray into it. Unforgiveness of self. Sometimes you will sit and you will focus on all your past mistakes and you will think that's who you are. That's exactly where the enemy wants you to be. If Father has said, I don't remember your sins no more, who are you to tell him and tell him he's wrong and bring it back up? We cannot get fixated on the past breaking downs. We need to learn from it and say, Father, look how far you've brought me and look at it anew. Okay? We have to let ourselves be forgiven. Okay? In certain cases, this is a PG moment, sexual sin might stop us from moving forward. Right? We have... In many cases, not always growing up in a godly environment. So what happens? We get stuck on pornography. We get stuck into sexual immorality. We have had premarital relations before. And then, have you guys ever heard of imprinting before? Imprinting. Imprinting. Okay. No, so that Sotas is not the way publicly taught. Okay, well, yeah. So what normally happens is that when you're um, 
intimate, your first, your first time, somehow gets imprinted in your mind and that sort of gets stuck in with your emotional response and your physical response and all that. Let's say, let's use the good old example, the first time was in the back of a Chevy. So now I get married years later. And then it's supposed to be intimate and beautiful and pure the way Paul says it is in marriage, except now it's in the bedroom and I just don't seem to have the right excitement levels. Because everything about what I've first experienced to be was forbidden in a car and in that space and my body actually responds to that reality. Now I have to take it and I have to fit that same thing and I put it here. Psychologically, they will go back to and then they will say, okay, well, there's a disconnect. So my focus becomes more on what happened then and then I want to bring it into the relationship and then I go, I just can't seem to, my husband is just not, my wife is just not, and because I've focused so much on this, or perhaps your first exposure thereof is also part of what I see on a screen or in a magazine and then I go, well, this is what that's supposed to be, right? And I get used to this and then I take it into my marriage and then I go for me to be it must look like this psychologically this is what they found and we're gonna go okay well hang on a second this is a little bit broken yet yeah? we wonder why it's become something instead of something pure as Paul would say it becomes something common We've kind of damaged the program a bit. And now we're going to go, okay, well, Father, I just, I just can't seem to break this. I just, you know, maybe it's your thoughts. Maybe it's the computer. Maybe it's magazines. Maybe it's, maybe it's whatever. I look, I look past and I see a handsome guy walking past and my mind immediately goes back to that one photo or that one thing or that one time. And then I'm not focusing on marriage, I'm not focusing on intimacy, I'm not focusing on connection, I'm focusing just on that. And you kind of get stuck. Right? If we start dealing with sexual immorality and how it affects, not only in congregation, but how it will affect you in your marriages and so on, it's a very different reality. It's one of those discussions that we normally don't really get into because we go, oh, you know, we, you know, we don't talk about that. It's kind of awkward. But it's a, it is a problem because you, it's soul ties. Not soul ties. Soul ties is not, a, not that level. Let me address that while we're here, all right? If we thought you get told that if you sleep with someone, then you are, you're, now your souls are connected. Prove that publicly to me anywhere. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. It's it's that's an open question. It just gets bandied around so often, and I don't believe in it. But this is what we do, and we go, "Oh, the reason I cannot connect with my new person is because I'm connected with my old person." Listen, when it says there's there are a few examples of the world, the the words, and their souls were tied together. David and Jonathan. Now, what are you really saying? <laughs> <laughs> but you're implying it if you if you're saying that's that's the man. And what 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 happens with um, little Benjamin? Remember when Joseph was saying, you know, oh, is my father still alive? It's just like this, like that. Bring little Benji. Let me see him. If anything happens to him, what did his father say? He's tied up with Benjamin, and then if he dies, I die. So what are you saying? Yeah, we will say it's favoritism, but it doesn't get taught as favoritism. Soul ties, particularly in congregations, is purely sexual. It has got no basis in the Bible whatsoever. Right? It's incorrect theology. And then we come in, and because we believe it, because someone said, you know, well, that sounds right, then we go, well, how then do I get rid of it? Now I have to further invent theology to cut soul ties. Name one disciple. Oh, the reason we are not happy in your marriage is because of your soul ties. Paul talks about marriage time and time again with people in Roman law where I purchase a person for that in my house. I have my wife, 
and I have my slave which I only use for intimacy. That's her job. I bought her for this reason. Does Paul in any instance say, oh, the reason you're unhappy is because you have salt eyes? No, he goes, what are we doing? This is not God, this is not marriage, this is not the way we're supposed to be. It's never mentioned in a sexual connotation anywhere in the text. If you want to go and look, please do. We have invented theology and we've brought it into the church. You know, this is the way it is. Is it nothing about salt eyes in the world? Not sexually. About... <laughs> Two guys, David and Jonathan, being connected together because of the... Listen, it says their souls were knitted together. What do you mean by that? As in our souls are tied together. It actually means like, well, if we're like, we're like brothers, it has nothing to do with any sort of implication of sexual anything. What we've done is we've adopted something and we've brought it in and we've gone, this is the way it is. We've misunderstood the text. What are ungodly souls? Is when the closest thing you are going to get to the kind of idea of a biblical soul tie is that when I have a connection with someone, as in you're sitting there and Tanya, and you go, you like my sister. It's just amazing. We, we understand each other, we connect, and that's the reality of it. That's what the Bible will call their souls on the together. Right? When we get to ungodly ones, you're, what you're trying to describe is a toxic relationship where I'm stuck in something that's a little bit broken and I don't know how to get out of it. But the reality is to get into that toxic relationship, one of you has moved away from God because I wouldn't treat you that way if I really loved you. You with me? So we have developed theologies again about pornography, about lust, about that, that shifts the responsibility of the person and blames something else. Well, I just can't break it. I must have the spirit of lust. I thought you had the Holy Spirit. Which one is it? Yeah, but what about those that have given their life and they still? <laughs> and they still. Very, very good, very good question. I once had a, had a man come to me and he told me his testimony. He says, there I was and um, struggled with pornography because he was exposed to it when he was very young. So he had this imprint. And he couldn't get rid of it, and he couldn't get rid of it, and he couldn't get rid of it. And then eventually he said, Father, listen, this is a simple reality. I'm going to sit and I'm going to pray and fast until you take it away. And he did. To the point where he kind of got a little bit confused about how Scripture operated. He said, if it says in the word, Father, that if my, my, my right eye causes me to sin, I'll pluck it out. And he was dead serious. He said, Father, if this is going to cure me of this thing, I'm going to pluck it out. Later I had to explain to him that's not what it really was talking about. But he was at the point where he didn't want to do with anything to do with that because of it for the heart. He knew it was destructive and he prayed and he fasted. you know what his heart condition about that stuff is now? I can sit and I can talk to you about it and I can tell you how I was stuck. And I can tell you now that if anybody even tries to expose anything of that sort, he physically gets nauseous. So he went from I cannot live without it to complete and utter repulsion. <laughs> now what happened there? How do we get to from one point where I'm stuck with it to the other point? Not just the Holy Spirit. What did he have to do? What was his choice? To fully submit and surrender to something that he knew wasn't of God. So he says, I'm letting this go. I don't want anything to do with it, Lord. This is not of you. I need you to take it. Isn't that what you do when you come into the water? When you give your life up, you go, you know, this is me, Father. I can't change me. I'm, I'm broken. I'm, I'm all this. I'm all that. And I need, you to, I need you to destroy it. But for some reason, we get stuck and we go into the baptism. We come out the other side and we have a little urge. Do you not realize that that urge is there as the enemy is throwing darts? Do you not realize that Father will use that to test your heart, to get you to the place where you realize that you're the problem? Because sometimes we go, oh, you know, it's supernatural, I can't do anything about it. You have taken away the power of God. 
you have turned it now into something formulaic that I need to go, oh, I, can't, I can't get rid of drinking unless, unless I go see someone and then they have to do whatever. My grandfather was a drunk, therefore I'm doomed forever. Is that what Christ said? It's about um, the, the scripture where, where your sins would be passed down to the third and fourth generation. What? The sins of the father. Okay, tell me where that comes from. Context is always key. Yeah. It's, uh, it's the Ten Commandments, actually. Exodus 20. Right? And he says that if those who hate me, who practice idolatry, because it's linked with idolatry, then the sins of the Father will carry on to the, th the effects thereof, will carry on to the third and fourth generation. But for those who love me, what will happen? Blessings and all that? So, 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 so the minute you turn around, that, 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 that curse of your father and your forefathers falls away. Yeah, well, let me ask you something. Can a new creation be cursed for the sins of the old? So then why do we carry that? Because there's so much about that as well. I mean, you know, what the father did and King Mashiri and this. Re remember there's Torah truth, simple Torah truth. Okay, I'm not going to go down this road. We don't have time. But you're going to test it against one simple reality. The son cannot be punished for the sins of the father. And the father cannot be punished for the sins of the son. That's Torah. I cannot hold my son accountable for my sin. Right? So why does God judge that? Will I feel the effects of a broken home because my father was broken? Absolutely. So that you get to the reality of, well, look, if my father was drunk and absent, I'm going to think that's a normal reality, so what's going to happen? Right? I'm going to think that's normal, and I'm going to replicate that. And then when I go there, and then I realize, I open up my Bible, I look at the text, and I say, Father, what's going on here? And he goes, well, this is what it's supposed to look like, and then what happens? I realized my vision of normal was wrong all along. And this has been the same truth throughout centuries. Think of it again. I want you to cast your minds into the text. Yeshua walks up to a Gentile or someone from Judah or someone. Now, maybe he's someone, maybe his daddy was a Pharisee. Does he come in and say, listen, you need to renounce Phariseeism before you can be? Ask forgiveness for the sins of your father before you can be my disciple? Yeah, doesn't actually say that. Yeah. So when Paul goes into Athens and stands in the Acropolis and in the market squares and things on, he's surrounded by idols and all the rest of it. Does he stand there and go, listen, guys, if you really want to be a disciple, you have to deal with all the sins of your past? Or does he say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand? Everything hinges on you. Now, in many cases, some of you have to come to the realization that you are not your parents. Maybe that's a level of unforgiveness you carry. Maybe it's a level of, I can't believe they put me through that. Maybe it's a level of, listen, I'm sitting here and I have a broken, distorted view and I can't understand why it's like this and this is where I am and this is what I thought was normal. And that breeds a whole bunch of hurt and frustration. And until you deal with that, you will be held back. You will struggle to move forward because, well, I am my father's son. Well, what about generational That's exactly what we were talking about. It's the same thing. The same thing. You know, you, sometimes you do see effect in families with, say, alcoholism. Yeah, but because... From the grandfather to the grandfather. Exactly. You know? And that's exactly that pattern. It's my version of normal. Think about... Yeah. There's a story. Okay, let me, let me, I'm, I'm sure I shared this with you before. It says there was a, there was a lady who, you know, she was, she was cooking, cooking a pot roast. And she absolutely loves it. She goes, okay, this is the way it is. And they cut it and she seasons it and she does all this stuff and she takes it, she sticks it in the oven, she comes out. And then it just, it's amazing every time. Her husband says, you know, what's, what's, what's the secret? Oh, no, you have to do this, and you have to do that, and you have to cut off this piece. And they go, okay, why? He goes, no, I don't, I don't know why. Let me, let me phone my mom. So she gets on the phone, and she goes, mom, you remember that pot roast? She says, like, yes, you know, like, you taught it. He says, no, I learned it from Omar. She goes, oh, okay, that's fantastic. Okay, she goes, it's like, we got to this point, and then my husband asked me, why did we cut off that piece? 
She goes, you know what? I've never asked. Let's get Omar on the line. She finds Omar, and then she goes through this whole process. She's like, Omar, why did you cut off the piece? And she goes, because my pan was only so big. <laughs> <laughs> when we understand alcoholism as a normal reality, okay, let's take now from maybe from a little bit of my life experiences. My, my, my parents had um, difficult relationships with theirs for different reasons, okay? And they came in, and my father's big thing was, you know, his, his father became... You're 13 years old, I've stopped hugging you, I've stopped kissing you, I've stopped this, and you're a man now. Shake my hand and that's it. Men must stand on their own two feet. And kind of created a distance. So my father's reality was one day I want to be in my son's lives enough so that when I'm sitting in the pub having a beer, they will want to come and have a beer with me. My mother's view on stuff is if you're going to be naughty, do it in front of me. Don't go there where I can't protect you. Be naughty here. Okay? Invitation. What do you think we did with that? Mm. <laughs> Mom, we want to try. We want to try a drink. It's okay, right? You're doing it at home. Yeah, fantastic. I'm not going to tell you what age I was. <laughs> we go to the pub. Or we go to the bottle store, and they go, "Okay, well, what do you want?" So we like, we want, we want to try that one. She's like, "Okay, it's cheaper by the case." <laughs> <laughs> So we bought a case, and we had a bride. Well, we can have one. Yeah, but you'll be stupid here. Mommy, we're having a bride. We want to try that. Mommy, we want to try that. Mommy, we want to try that. By the time I was 16, I was partying with 19-year-olds and drinking them under the table. And it wasn't frowned upon. It wasn't unacceptable. It was normal. Publicly, completely dysfunctional. You think I'm going to do that to my boy? Not even close. Now I can look back and I can go, well, this is what I thought was normal. This is the generation, the next generation, the next generation. We repeat the same pattern. Psychologically, spiritually, it's the same thing. You mimic your parents. And those might be fighting words, but the reality is we pick up a lot more than what we understand. And we get to the place of, okay, listen, this is the way it is. Why does it have to be that way? Oh, that's just because my dad did it that way. Or my mom did it that way. But when we talk about generational curses, we get to the point where we miss the text. For those who hate me. Now, you as a believer have given your life to God. You stand as a new creation and you go, can that text apply to a believer? No, because I've given up my life. I do not hate God. I'm not practicing idolatry to the point where you can keep all your rubbish, I'm pursuing. And then we take that again and we bring that into the congregations and we go, the real reason you're struggling is because of this. No, the real reason you're struggling is because you refuse to surrender or submit. You want to carry that stuff further. Yeah? So in line with the generational curse, um, like you think about principalities and the dark forces, yeah. you know, battle against flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. So now here's this principality and it says, ah, oh, look, this mom's weak in this area, follows on to child, follows on to next child. Follows. Right. Is that not also part of that where they're like, okay, because mom was weak in that area, child is probably going to be going to it, because as you said, you follow your sister. Right. Let me just cling on to that person. You know what I mean? Yeah. So how then? So then, so then, would that be like, look, I'm not completely 100% sold on the whole deliverance ministry yeah. stuff, but would that be that kind of thing? Like instead of blaming self and flesh and weaknesses, it's like, you know, I'm just going to blame the devil the whole time, or demons. Yeah. How much, the, the thing is, how much did you have to change when you became a believer? And we see that broken pattern throughout cycle. I mean, if you look at um, Isaac being deceived, right? How how was he deceived? How yeah? So, okay, through his vision, right? So and then he came in and they deceived him through through a vision. And we see the next pattern, right? So um, when Jacob was deceived, when Jacob did it, how was he deceived? 
not, not just that, but also later on with Joseph, right? When he comes up, is this not your son's goat? The goat's blood. So it becomes part of the same pattern. And if you see it, like Abraham, fear for his life, tells Sarah, she's my sister. And then what does Isaac do? That was the same thing. Why? Because it works so well for us. But the reality is, as you as believers are not following the pattern of your parents, you should be following the pattern of Christ. And that is ultimately where we, gotta, we have to make a decision. I'm either going to go, this is acceptable behavior for my son, and I'm going to buy him a case of tequila when I get home, or I'm going to go, he over my dead body. I have to get to the place where, okay, fine, my parents, maybe they lived together and they never got married, and look, they were happy. Doesn't make it right. No, now I can take that, and I, I've had friends that, that do it. Is a, a lovely, lovely friend of mine. Parents got divorced when they were young. She saw the damage it did. She refused to get married. First mistake. She got involved in relationships, and she carried on that thing. She said, I'll be loyal to you. I will be there, but don't ask me to marry you. Thereafter, through a string of broken relationships, guess where she is now? No, she turned out and she is now batting for the other side, focusing on, oh, woman never hurt me. They were always there for me, so therefore I'm now here. One step away from that text and away from that text, and we take all responsibility away from ourselves. And this is where it all becomes such a difficult and amazing tool is when I get to the place of going, oh, hang on a second, I'm noticing that yeah, I have an issue now with... Um, sexual immorality or if I have an issue with unforgiveness and I realize that my parents, you know, they had really pretty bad relationships, maybe I'm mimicking the same thing. Now maybe I should come in and say, Father, I suck at unforgiveness, please teach me. You are continually being conformed into the image of Christ if you so choose. Or you're looking for excuses. So it's a place that we have to work on our salvation. Yeah. In many cases. Process. You yeah. never yeah. convicted until that day. Remember again, I remind you of what Paul said. In in my mind I wrestle. Yeah. You know, he continually has this wrestling. Yeah. I know what I should do, and then I do the things I know I shouldn't. Yeah. This was a believer who was struggling with himself, not just powers and principalities, not just about something, you know, oh my poor father was a Freemason or you know, my dog was used in a, he was a voodoo chant dog, I don't know. And he knew now all of a sudden that it takes away the fullness and the power of the Holy Spirit in me, where when Yeshua walked around through, empowered by the Holy Spirit and a legion of demons ran towards him, when no one could hold this guy, fell at his knees in front of him. It wasn't a contest. That is the same Holy Spirit you have in you. And now you're telling me you can't conquer sin? Rubbish. You have justified your natural responses and refused to surrender them to God so that you can go, oh, it must be a generational thing. Or it must be this. Or it must be that. Or it's being taught everywhere. Absolutely. Wow. Are stuck. And then what do we do? We go to deliverance ministries or to deliverance or we got deliverance or deliverance. I, I know, again, I, I've, I've been exposed to this, so forgive me if I'm a little bit passionate about it. Okay? I know people that you don't know. So this is not a Lashon Hora. This is just a friendly fire warning. That the family has gone to deliverance thing after deliverance thing, prophetic thing after prophetic thing, running from pillar to post that is so broken and living in sin. I'm like, the amount of deliverance you guys have gone through, you, you should be like levitating yeah. if it worked. <laughs> but ultimately, the thing is, I see a, not one, but two children running, running from God. I see... Parents that seem to be clinging only when it's convenient. I see hypocrisy. I see brokenness. And yet, I see them sitting in congregation with a smile on their face saying, you know what, what we teach is right. I'm like, your fruit is, is far off that. So what happens with the Freemasonry? Because that's a very strong... 
Listen, you were under the curse of sin and death before Christ got hold of you. You're telling me that's not, that's not stronger than Freemasonry? If he set me free from my sin, if he set me free from death, if he set me free for all eternity, you're telling me he can't? What I found quite, quite amazing is, is, is the devil still went to test Yeshua even yeah. after when, when he might have been pursued with Yeshua. Right. I mean, you're not going to win if you're going to test Yeshua. Why would the devil? Remember, remember how he tempted you, sure. Okay? It's not, not just the, the twisting of the narrative. Okay? Remember, John 3, pre, um, sorry, Matthew 3 preludes Matthew 4. Matthew 3 is the baptism and the declaration of God from heaven. This is my son. It's not up for discussion. It is a statement. What was Satan's continual question? If you are. Uh, if you are the Son of God. If you are the Son of God. If you are the Son of God. Listen to the way this works. If you're really saved, you wouldn't be struggling with pornography. If you are this, then you surely wouldn't do that. If you are that. Oh, you said free, are you? You know your daddy was a Freemason. Ooh, now I don't know if you're free. Are you, are you sure you're free? Yeah, I don't know. Freemasonry is pretty bad. Oh, hang on a second. I'm a new creation. Even if we were to follow the pattern, even if we were to follow the pattern of voodoos and unbelievers and pagans, because let's face it, the gospel went into Africa. The gospel has dealt with San Gomez, people that were, I mean, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law was the priest of Midian. Nebuchadnezzar, king, idolatry. And they turn around and they say, I now know that there is one God. And I get to the place of complete repentance and I turn to the Father. There is no thereafter where God condemns them. Because of your father. No, because, oh, well, you know, actually, you know what, you did great, but your father was still fraught, so you were on the, on, on the back line. If I, if I were to do it from a New Testament perspective, I'm a sinner, I'm, doing, I'm going through all the sinning in many different ways, and I get there, and then I go into the water, God promises that I will come up something new. Everything about that former life has now died. If there was a thing going through that way of generational curses, it died with him. Me as a new creation, filled with the Holy Spirit, is now something new. Now, I'm made of the image of my father. If you don't be free, you can still be cut off. Yeah, but that's again a choice. It's about heart condition, which ultimately this is an all come down to. When I'm dealing with, I'm dealing with unforgiveness. When I'm dealing with sin, if I'm dealing with any sort of immorality, if I'm dealing with drunkenness, if I'm dealing with this, ultimately for me as a disciple, and I'm saying I'm pursuing God, but hang on a second, there's a little bit of a sidestep there. What does that come down to? The point of that, is it everybody else's fault that I have a sidestep, or is it because now all of a sudden I'm focusing on what I want instead of what God wants? This is where the tacky meets the tar. We are refusing to walk and pursue Christ because really what we want is we want to pursue self. And then, when, then the blame game starts. Oh, if I could only be free from this. Are you telling me that Christ cannot set you free? But just to add to that, Ezekiel 18, um, because I was also kind of like a few, a few months ago, I had this question of the generational things. Mm -hmm. Then I read Ezekiel 18 about the proverb that was in the land that the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are blunted. Mm -hmm. And then the father deals with that whole proverb. And how he says that the being who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the wickedness of the father, nor the father bear the wickedness. The righteousness of the righteous is upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked is upon himself. It says it time and time again in various shapes or forms. But somewhere along the line, we go to the place where it's more acceptable for me to believe in a theology that's not in the Bible. Now, again, this is not the popular message. You will have people, if you mention any of this, 
that you are not spirit led you don't understand you don't understand god and you definitely are are or clueless in the spiritual realm. You don't have a right line like me. Listen to me. All I'm asking you to do is if you can find any evidence of that in the text where any one of the disciples or Yeshua himself, the rabbi himself, if you can find any example of anything of the sort that they're selling you, then you come and we can sit and have that discussion. If you don't see it addressed, that should tell you something. <laughs> if I'm going to pursue that and preach that, then I'm not preaching Christ. I got a scripture the other day in Isaiah, Isaiah and I wish I'd written it down, but it was very good for me in the sense that because you always worry about the people like the father or whatever that that you know that they were atheists, so you know that they died that way. Hmm. You know when it comes to the end, unless something happened, you know they're not going, you know. Yeah. So you the people that you and it, 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 the Isaiah scripture was something about you will forget, you will remember no more. Um, the bad things. Well, only in, in the new, I don't know what scripture it is. Probably it spoke to you. That's important. <laughs> okay. All right. What else can stop me? Shame and rejection causes insecurity. Insecurity means that you're not secure. I'm not focusing on who I am in Christ, I'm focusing on who I am not. Maybe control. Is stopping me. I have the fear of the unknown, so therefore I can't really submit to God. I can't really surrender to God. I can't, it, in the midst of that fear, sometimes it creates anger outbursts, out, outbursts. And then because of that, we don't deal with our own sin. You with me? Judgment. Out of love. Causes division. Remember, we're, you know, God will separate. We are called to be echad. Don't get yourself into a place where no congregation is good enough. We've been talking about this a lot, but I have if you are not moving forward, you have a fear, you perhaps have a fear of committing to God, a fear of committing to discipleship, and a fear of committing to fellowship. I've seen people that have been hurting congregations come into a congregation and sit on the sidelines because they haven't dealt with their past. I've seen people come in and then I call it playing church. You sit here, you warm a pew, and there's no accountability, no expectation, and as soon as I say, what are you doing? They're out the door and they're finding a next congregation. Because all they want to do is sit and they want to listen to a message. They don't want to apply anything. What we do here is very different to that reality. There is an accountability. There is a structure. There is a biblical basis. If you're not conforming to the biblical basis, my heart's cry to you is, what are you doing? Sometimes you've been hurt a lot in the past. And I get that. We all have. So now me surrendering to God's will... What are they going to think of me? How, how are we going to, how am I going to explain this? You know, if I, if I, if I, if I say now I'm a disciple, am I, am I really good enough to be a disciple? I let me remind you, he called fishermen. They were, they, the whole point of him calling fishermen was that the world told them they weren't good enough. And how many times did they fail? They were continually tripping over their own mouths or their own feet. And yet God chose them, and look at what happened in spite of themselves. If you take self out of the, out of the equation, can any of us, if God's, God, God just says this simple statement, when it's all said and done, you're going to be with me for eternity, if you just choose. Can we do anything to change that reality? No. Can we do anything to help that reality? Well, if you just choose... Choice is the big point there, right? But say now we're chosen, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do that reality. Ultimately, God has to do 99% of the work. You have to make your choice. Right? If I get to the point of I'm, God said, in your going, make disciples, and I'm choosing to be a disciple. 
then I have to pitch up. He has to train me. He has to mold me. He has to equip me. He has to empower me. Because if he doesn't do any of those things, there's no way I'm going to become like Christ. There's absolutely no way. What do you have to do? You have to make a choice and surrender to that reality. You are not called just to be believers. You are called to be disciples. Nothing stops you. Remember, he says, Lech achorai, come and follow me. And they left their nets and their boats. In essence, they left their, their identity. They were the fishermen. They left their homes. Some of them left wives. Some of them left their income. I'm going, it's worth the risk. Yeah, what's that? The family they left behind. I don't see the husband. And well, not for a while, but you're going to sit down. Can you imagine your child coming up to you and then going, God's called me. And your heart cry should be like, well, then you stick close. Learn everything. Take every moment up because you're going to go through a training process. And when it's all said and done, you're going to be like him. And then the work is going to pick up. Then the work starts. All right now, you just have to take on that joke. You have to go, okay, I've been hurt before. Other people have got it wrong. And again, in this place, I'm not asking you to follow me. I'm going to share with you a biblical truth, and it's up to you to accept it. But there's going to come a point where hopefully that you get to the place of, well, this is what the Bible teaches, and if you don't start acting on that, then I'm going to start asking questions. We can't get to the place of choosing to pursue Christ. And then go, well, that's what he taught. Yes, that's, that's what he did. Yes, why aren't you? Woo. Why are you choosing to hang back? Why are you choosing fear instead of faith? Why are you choosing? Because this new identity should not have breaks. This new identity should turn. That's where he said I'm going to end up, and that's where I'm walking. And he's going to have to do 99% of the work. And he's going to look at me and he's going to say, okay, you know that? I know that hurt. You know that brokenness? I need you to let it go. You know that thing over there? I want you to give that up. How do, you, how do I give that up, Lord? He's going to tell you the same thing over and over again. Follow me. Do not shift focus. I think we're getting, we're getting close to that time. It says, something that I might be stuck at, I believe more the outside influences of who I am versus <clears throat> what God says I am. Little old me, little broken me, little nothing me. Or, ah, oh, you know what? Joe is such a fantastic telecommunications guy, and he, there she is under, and um, he builds his whole identity up in his job. You know, we saw, well, there were friends, friends of ours that came and this, this guy had a pretty high-powered job. I'm talking about they flew him around the world and when he pitched up, it was yes sir, no sir, three bags full, whatever you need. They put him in the best places. He walked into mega factories and he's like, this is what I want, this is what I want, this is what I want. And his family was in tatters, so he prayed about it and he said, all right, I'm leaving this and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna come back to basics. And he lost his job. And then he started to really struggle. Because the way he would be identified is that's the guy with this title. Now, what happens if the title's not there? Do you cease to stop existing? No. We're like, oh, you know, <clears throat> hi, I'm Vince, and this is my BMW. Hi, I'm Vince, and I'm, you know, have you, have you seen my black Visa card? We make it about everything else and the, the world will pant it to it and they will say, you're, you're amazing because of whatever. But you might be 
dying on the inside because you're not measuring up to your identity that God has called you to be. It's a big men problem. It's a, it's a people problem. It's massive. It's massive. But men, because what, what, what is the programming about, about men? Well, what are you supposed to be to be a man? Tell me, men. <laughs> you gotta, you got to earn some big bucks. What else do you have to be to be a man? Yeah, real cowboys don't cry. What else? Oh, we don't cry and we have to make money? That seems to be a list. The wife, the wife oh, yeah, that's it. I have to have the dream. Oh, uh, well, I, have to, I have to be a ninja as well because if you come to my house, I can kill 15 people with my pinky. <laughs> what else? You have to be the strongest oak in the room. You have to drive the flashiest car. If you really want to understand a successful man, that's what he looks like. And I will urge you men again, look at the most amazing man we have, your rabbi. Tell me what car he drove. Donkey? It wasn't even his. It wasn't even his. <laughs> Tell me about his seven-bedroom mansion by the ocean. He didn't even have a home. Tell me about his mega church. Yeah, he <laughs> oh, you know, I have 500 disciples who whittled down to 11. Oh, you know, his ministry showed such promise, but... Just do me a favor. How many people are here? Are you going to tell me you can't change the world with the people sitting in this room? About the world. <laughs> oh, you have little faith. <laughs> you don't understand the miracle that he's already done in you to get you to this place. He's still got a lot of work to do. Huh? No, he's, he's, he's working, but are we willing? That's the thing. Don't let these things hold you back. My biggest problem I was speaking to you at fellowship, our little fellowship on Tuesday and I said, you know, sometimes I think I just need to shut my mouth because nobody likes to accept who I am and what I am and I want to share. And I, every time I share, I just seem to get such like, people are so offended. Your new identity will be offensive to the world. I'm sure it's still because it's offended there. I seem to offend yeah. anybody. We're, we're, we're not, we're not going to win any popularity contest, I'll give you that. But you know, on the, on the other hand, and I actually mentioned it to Joe, and it's really starting to irritate me. Never really used to, but I always used to go, I cringe. You know, you get all these messages like, um, faithful woman, you are daughter, you're a daughter of the Most High, you are special, you are unique, you are this, you are that, you are like a queen. And, you know, all these like, wow, to lift you up and up. Thinking to myself, good grief, where's the repentance? Where's the, yeah. I am a worm type of, hey, I'm nothing, I'm nobody except through Yeshua. Yeah. Except, you know, and, and then I, was, I think to myself, we are living in those days where Paul said men or whoever said men and women will be lovers of self. And that's all I see is self, self, self. I am special, I am this, I am that. And it's just such a yeah. ticking. It's we're 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 a pen, we're a pendulum swing. The yeah, problem is, is that we need to understand our identity in the fullness. If I don't understand that you're that I'm a daughter of the Most High, then I have a problem. But, but in the context of that, yes, it's not a puffing up thing. Yes. The thing is, when you when you get to the the essence of a title, so when God says to you daughter, or He says to you son. Understand that it's always about relationship, nothing more. He's saying, this is who you are to me. And that's a funny thing about Hebrew, right? Is that when I say, I can't say my son in Hebrew. I can say Ben Shali. And then they shorten it to go Benny. Or you might hear me say Benny. What it means is son to me. That's not my wife. She's a wife to me. What happens if she stopped acting like a wife? You're talking about an exclamation point. I think 
Elia made the point there for me. That's what happens when she stops acting like a wife. There's some foul smelling things going on there. What happens if I stop acting like a, the son of God? See, it's relational. So that if I understand who I am, then when Satan comes in and goes, if you are truly safe, if you are actually, if you are this, if you are that, you are already so secure in your identity, that's not even the issue. The saddest thing that I'm seeing, and it's so, so horrible, is that, that, that all the prophecy and scripture and, and Jeremiah all, is all so true to this world today, the people, and, and lovers of self. And, and, and I mean, at five o'clock today, they're all going to go and watch the South African rugby. And then they're going to be jumping up and they're going to be cheering people. And I've been there and yeah, you remember, you gotta love them for where they are and hate the sun. No, I love it. So when you get to the place of, you know, like, we we need to be careful that obviously if you are walking your identity, it is with humility and meekness. Yeshua had the authority to come down and take over the entire earth without battering an eyelid. He had an army of angels ready at the, at just the drop of a hat that would have happened. But at the simple reality, he came in riding on a donkey and he came to serve in the fullness of who we are. Don't look at the world and go, oh, the world's acting like the world. That's, your focus is going to be completely... Um, That's so sad. That, I'm just finding it so sad. It will be, but the reality is I want you right now to focus on you. Because if we get better at reflecting Yeshua, the more chance we have is bringing them out of their darkness. If we don't, then we're just practicing the same thing. If I'm a lover of self and I only develop a theology of self and this is who I am, where it's all about self, then they go, you know what, you're actually, that's, that's fantastic. And they say, you're doing it and I'm doing it, but I'm the one that's wrong. Oh, hang on, hang on a second. It's like if you, if, you could just, if you could just for a moment see yourself the way God sees you, just for a moment, maybe then you would walk with a little bit more faith. Maybe you would walk a little bit more boldly. Maybe you would with, with just be able to surrender just a little bit more, just to be able to take that step and entrust him for what he's putting you through, the process that he's putting you through, if you would just choose it. What is unforgiveness if it's going to hold me back from my true calling? What is TV? What is people? What is any of this if it's going to hold me back? It's not worth it. But if I could just take that moment, if I could just take that moment, Maybe there would be something just so much more. All right. I'm, sorry, Joe, you want to finish? I'm going to stop. You spoke about. Just off the record, that. Like, Father, we just want to thank you. Again, for this time together, Father, and I just pray that as we, as we go through this, this list, Father, that you would just help us, teach us and guide us, Father, help us to, to change and be molded into your image. Help us to let go, Father, surrender and trust you more. For your sake, Father, for your kingdom, Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Amen.